live. Hello, welcome, welcome everybody. Oh my god, we have people in the chat already. Hell yes. Arjun, <laughs> WWE vibes. Yes, that is exactly what we're going for. Uh, Lisa, yeah, good to see you. Muhammad, Andy's here, of course. I want to introduce Mariah, the guest of our session today. Welcome, Mariah. Hi, what's up? I'm super <laughs> excited to be here. I actually just opened up the, the YouTube thing in another tab so I could see what we look like. Ooh, how do we look? I just clicked on your YouTube link that you shared. And so now I'm just like watching us in like a 10 second delay. Nice. That's not going to be confusing at all. I think we look good. <laughs> oh, there we are. We look different. We're side by side. I don't see that on my side. Okay, Here cool. we are. Um, okay, so everybody, to introduce Mariah real quick, she had me on her podcast earlier this year, and it was literally the most fun conversation I've ever had in a recorded setting. We talked about all things business, organic search, blogging, but most importantly, matters of the soul. Diving deep, like why do you do this stuff? Why are you a blogger? And what are your underlying motivations and things like that? So we'll be touching on all that, but real quick, Mariah, she's an award-winning SEO strategist and consultant. She's helped hundreds of clients get focused on driving traffic from search engines. That is literally what she does. And I'd say one of her superpowers is finding ways to harness clever gaps in the market so that people can drive traffic on topics that actually matter rather than going after writing about things like business ideas, finding the stuff that people in your niche can really benefit from and want to come to you to help with your solutions. So that's Mariah's focus. And something that I really love about her to, to give you a compliment here is that I feel like you're one of the few people I know in this space who literally only knows how to speak your truth. Um, there's no BS that comes out of you. So <laughs> I wanted to shine a light on that and say thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I always say, like, even to my boyfriend, I'm literally like, don't ask for my opinion if you truly don't want it. I, I can't help it. Truly, like I can't help it. And like last week I ended up posting a review about Right Blogger and then I sent it to you and Andy and I was like, heads up i did give my honest review on this and like i just I, I can't help myself you know what i mean but i also try to be super intentional about like bringing in the good do you know what i mean just like really highlighting the things that are really good and really yummy and like really juicy about life and about like certain things that we're doing so that it can like balance the honesty too because i feel like a lot of people kind of like shy away from the honesty shy away from the transparency because it can feel uh intense sometimes but like there's so much truth in that and if we just do it in a way that comes from the heart i feel like it just it lands in a more authentic way for people you know what i mean like i'm not trying to like pull the wool over anybody's eyes or like lie about anything so yeah i i appreciate that a lot. I think, you know, this actually gets to the first question I wanted to ask you and, and kind of jumpstart our conversation today. You know, what is the role of truth look like in your business? And how do you try and like teach that to the people you work with? Like, can you try and connect these threads of like truth to blogging and attracting people to your website? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is that you are what makes you unique. Like there's so many other like SEO strategists, SEO consultants, SEO educators out there. There's nobody that does it in the way that I do it, how I do it, like I do it in the way that I do it. Like there just, there isn't, there is no other me. And I feel like who we are uniquely is our superpower, but we water it down because we're afraid of being called out for it, not being accepted. And like all of those are totally valid. I've gone through situations where I felt all of that really deeply. But I feel like when it comes to especially creating content on the internet, especially in the age of AI, we can generate any kind of content we want, but like what's going to make this blog post better than this blog post or not even better, but like different. 
it's going to be your perspective, your authentic take on it. And so I think like that's where the juice is. That's where the magic is. And so even with my clients, when we're working on SEO and like, I know we're going to talk about keyword research, but it's literally my favorite thing ever. And I tell them, I was like, if we're trying to target a keyword, like we don't have to create the same BS content that everybody everybody else has created about this. Actually, I believe Google's algorithm is going to start trying to show different perspectives in Google search results. And so I do have a really good example for this. So about two years ago, I tried running away from SEO, which is like hilarious. It's my own like personal journey and tried running away. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to be an intuitive business coach, right? So then I'm like, okay, so I obviously want to show up on Google for the keyword intuitive business coach. So the first thing that I do is Google it. I want to see what's already showing up for it. There was two blog posts at the top. The first one was why you should hire like an intuitive business coach or like what is an intuitive business coach, like something like that. Super like educational, informational, helpful, helpful content. The next one, number two, is why you shouldn't hire an intuitive business coach. (laughs) Which option do you think that I clicked on? It was definitely why you shouldn't hire one. So then in that content, what I realized that that person did was they targeted the keyword, but allowed themselves to perspective shift in the content itself. And it's not like this person was like, never hire an intuitive business coach. They're trash. Like, don't do it. Like, it's not what she was saying. She literally was like, hey, hire one. They're super magical. Like, definitely do it. It can definitely be worth it. But just keep in mind, you don't want somebody that just comes into this space with the intuition piece. You also want somebody that understands business, that understands marketing, so that they can kind of bridge them together. And so that was kind of, that's just a really good, like, real life example of why authenticity matters because I'm pretty sure I ended up either jumping on her email list or like following her on social media because I was like, I love this perspective. And so I feel like that's just, that's the juice that we all have inside of us. It just, it takes some work in order to kind of unleash it. Yeah, this is really good. This is really fertile territory. And I have, I have some thoughts on this, but I want to just say for everyone watching, please, 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 if anything jumps out at you as something that you want to dig a little deeper on, Ask us questions in the chat because we're going to have a lot of time for live Q&A towards the end of this. And we'll be able to dig into all these questions that you guys have. We want to make a lot of time for that. But I think, you know, where this goes for me is I think that a lot of people, and I've fallen into this myself when I was earlier in my blogging journey, pursue writing about a topic because of the, like, SEO opportunity it has. You know, you... You do your keyword research, you see, oh, wow, 10,000 a month searches for this, right? Obviously, I should write about this. And a lot of people, instead of like finding that opportunity and then deciding first, how do I feel about this? Who am I uniquely in response to this topic? They'll jump right into the research, you know, like you look at how what you were just talking about, how these other articles position themselves on the topic how these other people are thinking about it and that is why so much content on the internet is just a version of regurgitated same advice same steps same education same opinions whereas you know i think what the superpower really is is taking that time like even if it's five minutes or maybe it's an hour maybe it's a day a week whatever that kind of creative generative process looks like for you but taking that time to be like, oh, here's how I feel about this topic rather than just immediately jumping in and writing. Yeah, I, I think that that, like, I, I mean, I've said it a million times, like, it's ju- that's where the juice is. Also, like, if you're selling something, if you're selling a digital product, if you're selling an ebook, if you're selling a service, if you're selling something, in order to get somebody to buy from you and like not in a manipulative way but like in order to get somebody to buy from you like we buy from people that we know like and trust and i know the bloggers have heard this probably over and over and over again but like how do we get people to know like and trust us they have to see our perspective and our personality because it makes it really difficult for somebody to know like and trust us when they have no idea what what we are or we're like a watered down version of ourselves or like our brand is showing up as like super generic 
And I feel like we can talk about like conversion rate optimization and all of that stuff and like all of like the step-by-step -step and technical things to tweak. But like, what about your personality? That can help convert too. Oh my gosh. That I've been finding is like a gold mine for me lately. And I wanted to get your take on this before like jumping into my perspective. But something that's been really helpful for me is video on this like doing these live sessions doing more videos on youtube and really showing like who i am what my personality is what my like where my hard stands are on these topics as a way to be more real with people what is the role of like video for you now as someone who's been like so focused on seo traffic for so long how do you look at video? How should people who are watching here today be thinking about it in their mix of how they spend their limited time? Yeah, so I started off my business specifically focusing on, focusing on writing blog content. And all of that was great. I think that it's still super beneficial. But where I'm spending most of my time now is growing my YouTube channel, honestly, for numerous reasons, right? So like SEO still comes into play there. I still get most of my YouTube traffic from people searching terms that I'm creating videos to be the best solution to the problem for. So SEO, SEO still comes into play. The videos are still long form, they're still sustainable, they're still searchable after two years, three years, four years. And I'm also starting to do YouTube lives, which you're going to be on my YouTube channel. We're going to be having a conversation next week. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely hop over to my channel, make sure that you subscribe over there. Uh, so I think having those conversations and being on video is a really great way to be able to share my perspective, share my expertise. But to be honest, it took me a long time to get here. I was horrified to show up on video. It was the scariest thing ever. And I remember literally like to this day, even when I record a YouTube video, like I start sweating and I'm like, Mariah, it's literally recorded. Like nobody's seeing this. We can delete this. But like, I still get nervous about it. So just know that if you're like, video seems really scary. It seems really awful. Just know that like, that's a normal feeling to have. It feels really vulnerable, especially when you're on a live we're not going to edit this. People are going to hear my mistakes. They're going to hear when I fumble my words. They're going to hear when I get lost in like my thought process and stuff like that. But you're able to bounce back a little bit better the more that you do it. And so how I actually started doing it was not really jumping in on YouTube. It was doing Instagram stories. It was just talking on my Instagram stories. Those only last 24 hours, shorter shelf life. And I felt like I could kind of fine tune my message, fine tune my perspective and really build up my confidence in showing up on video. And then I would say the other thing that's really helped really in tandem to that is being a guest on people's podcasts, because that's not the video aspect, but that's me being able to flow. That's me being able to talk and trust what's coming out of my mouth. And so like being confident on video, being confident of your voice and allowing yourself to flow, those two things go hand in hand. So it's like, how can we look at both of them and like slowly baby steps start to increase confidence in both arenas. Yeah, I love that. Like the only way through, well, the only way to get there is going through it, doing it yeah. a lot, repetition. Unfortunately, making unfortunately. Money. Oh, I know. Isn't it amazing? Whenever I meet someone who's just like instantly amazing and super comfortable at video, I'm like, dang, you got lucky. <laughs> For sure. And I think that some people do have a natural talent, but I think that like, most of the time we're all horrified yeah yeah i i'm i'm with you like i you know andy and i andy's in the chat he's he's my partner with right blogger here uh we hung out together last weekend in chicago um jamming on right blogger stuff creating content and you know i i found for the first time really like that i hit this stride of like oh i can just talk for you know, 20, 30 minutes straight and we got 10 YouTube shorts out of it. And I think there's something really to be said for having uh, a partner, a person who can be there like coaching you, like Andy really built me up. Like he was able to say like, you know, you're doing great. And like, he kind of guided me with some questions and whatnot. You're doing so, great, sweetie. You're doing great. You're doing great, sweaty. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really helpful to have someone else who can 
kind of act as a producer of sorts, even though like, you know, this isn't pro level stuff that we're doing here, but it's, it's fun when it's more collaborative to me. So finding those things that I take joy from and where I get energy from, like sitting in front of a camera just by myself, I can do it, but it's not as like interesting. It's not as fun for me. And so I think something that like Andy and I will experiment with is just having him on like a zoom with me so that he's like watching me. He's kind of with me while I'm making some content. And so these are the little ways that I'm finding like, okay, if I set myself up for success, I'll feel like doing more video. And like to, to bring this back home, video is SEO. Like YouTube yes. is the second largest search engine in the world. It's owned by Google and video results often show up in Google search results too. So I think that's something that a lot of people are really sleeping on and mostly because it's scary, honestly. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't have to be scary. I'm, I'm testament to that. Like I, I started really doing video for the first time, I'd say like this year, taking it somewhat seriously. And then I go in phases with it. But I think everyone should be experimenting with it and finding your way to like get the energy you want from doing video because it it is for sure the future um not to like throw out written content but how do you like to think do you like to produce videos first and then derive written content from it or do you take the opposite approach something else in between it depends i've done it both ways it kind of just depends on like what feels easier for me in the moment I'm one of those people that like I'll set the container and set the intention and then allow myself to flow in between. I'm kind of a little rebellious at heart. I mean, big surprise. But like if I set up a specific process for things, for different things, especially when it comes to creativity, when it comes to creating content, if I set up a very specific process, sometimes I won't do it, but sometimes I like that. So it's like I give myself the flexibility to be able to start with a written form of content and then I can use that as a script if I want to, or I can kind of just wing it. But to be honest, my YouTube channel, like the pre-created videos are really more tutorial based. That's what I love. I love being able to produce like more actionable and like, here, let me walk you through this because for some reason, and this is why I think I'm obsessed with SEO. For some reason, I have this gift of being able to like break down complex things into like easy to understand ways. And as we know, SEO is one of those can be super overwhelming. Same thing with website tech, super overwhelming. Same thing with diving into new SaaS tools, super overwhelming. So I like doing the tutorials, but that's also why I started doing YouTube lives because like I wanted those like fly off the seat of my pants, like just have a conversation and an invitation for collaboration. So like, I don't like li going live by myself. I would rather have a conversation, have something to respond to, and then be able to get like two people's zones of genius to come and create like one killer conversation. So I think it depends. Yeah. I love this though. It's, it's really like, it's unique to everyone. And where like your success in content creation comes from is in finding the things that work for you. You know, like I, I've spent years like beating myself up about like, oh, I'm not doing video. I should be doing video. Why am I not doing video? And it really wasn't until I became more comfortable with myself on camera. And I think it really, to, to go deep here, everybody, it comes back to building trust in yourself. Like I- 100%. I now trust myself. Like, I am like, this is going to be fucking great. And I know it. Um, I know we're using some four letter words here. I don't know if that's a YouTube. <laughs> no, no. But uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna just roll how we want to roll. Um, but yeah, I, I want to bring this back to something that I think will be really interesting to everyone here today. Um, you, we talked a little bit about, or we've talked plenty of times about finding like the longer tail niche topics um keyword research obviously is a part of this but how do you like today when you're when you're coaching people you're working with people how do you like to guide them towards finding more niche topics that will have like that higher intent for the readers to take an action that they want them to take so not just people that come to your site to read an article, but take some sort of action. How do you like to think about that as a problem solving? 
Yeah. So I think the first thing that comes to mind is like play. I really like try to bring in my clients, like even when we're doing, I actually just did a keyword research call with like apparently a really well-known client that I didn't know like how well-known they were until I knew like how well-known they were. And I was like, oh, so then it was like, I'm on the call and I was like, should I feel nervous? Do I No, like this is my arena, right? Like this is my zone of genius. Their zone of genius was like what allowed them to step into their space, right? And so I was like, you know what? But like we started just with playing. And so I was like, okay, like dream scenario here. If you could show up for keywords, like what keywords align with how you want to show up? How are you supporting people? Because if we're going to break SEO down and like getting on Google down into the most basic form, it's how can we be the best solution to the problem? But we can't do this in a way that's like super selfish. Like I want to be on page one for SEO because I am the best SEO person. It's like, I mean, like you might be, I, I don't know. You might be, but we also have to like, are you the best solution for the person typing in that specific keyword? And you have to be honest with yourself because in order to get on Google, you have to be the best solution to the problem. And how do we outrank the people already on page one? We have to be a better solution than them, but also show Google that we're a better solution than them. So there's like different things that kind of come into play here. But the one piece that I feel like really makes a difference in terms of conversions and finding the right keywords is paying attention to intent. Mm -hmm. Why is this person searching for this keyword? So like, that's why we don't recommend trying to target seed keywords. Those really basic one to two word keywords like SEO, because like, what is the person looking for when they're going to Google and typing in SEO? I don't know because that keyword is not specific enough. Are they looking to learn SEO? Do they want an SEO course? Do they want SEO tips? Do they want SEO e-commerce? Like, I don't know because it's not specific enough. Same thing with like copywriter. Are they looking to hire a copywriter? Do they want to become a copywriter? Are they looking for copywriting jobs? I don't know. So if we take it back to what I said before, we have to become the best solution to the problem. How can we become the best solution to the problem? We don't understand what they're looking for. So that's why user intent is so important when it comes to keyword research. And I feel like this is a piece that a lot of people gloss over. So an example is I was doing keyword research for a client. She was a speaking coach, right? And she was like, Raya, I want to show up on page one for the, for the keyword, powerful speaker. Okay, Ooh. go to, oh, go to Google and type in powerful speaker. It's car audio and stereo speakers, <gasps> okay? <laughs> so I was like, so actually, no, we don't want to target this keyword because it's not aligned with how we view the keyword. And so I think we ended up targeting like become a powerful speaker or something like that. That's a lot more specific. But if we didn't Google the keyword before we tried to target it, she would have gotten frustrated. She would have gone into her Google search console. She would have seen, I'm not showing up for powerful speaker. This was a waste of time. It was a waste of money. But it's like, you were never going to show up for powerful speaker. Do you know what I mean? So I feel and like- why would you want to based on what's there? Based on what's there. But a lot of people don't think about it. They just, we're all tunnel vision in our industry. So it's like even typing in the word singer, if you type in the word singer, the sewing machine shows up. If you type in the singer, I think it's like song lyrics show up. So it's like paying attention to the words that combine and trying to figure out like, does this align? And do I want to be the best solution to this problem? Will this lead into people signing up for my email list? Will it lead into sales of my digital products, my e-commerce products, all of that stuff? So there's a lot of things to juggle when it comes to keyword research. And I feel like people are barely scratching the surface with it. And then they're getting frustrated when they're not getting conversions, when they're not getting results. And it's because, yeah, because we don't understand the deeper foundations of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I think that's something that's so important and it's worthy of really, like, investing a lot of time. I think I try and think through this all the time now. Like, I, I've been on this campaign on, on my blog to, so I obviously blog about blogging, super meta. And there's a million things you can talk about within blogging, but I'm approaching how I reach beginners now in such a different way than I used to. Like I, I used to just have this how to start a blog article that ranks on page one of Google 
and was driving I like overwhelmed by those i literally was like how to start a blog oh god well i mean like where are you starting how much do you know about this like how exactly. much do i have to add into this information it's so overwhelming that i would be in like analysis paralysis and then i was like well i can't create a better option than this it's so much it's so much and like most people shouldn't compete on that like you shouldn't really go for that necessarily like you'll find way more fruit by going after like how to start a blog and make money or how to start a blog for free and make money like that's a yeah. way better way to think about it like getting that intent narrowed down and to really like spread that out as an example i've started to do things like blogging for beginners and reasons to start a blog mistakes to avoid when you're starting a blog so catching people who are asking these more specific questions related to this overarching topic that i want to create about and that's how i like to think about it is what are the like questions people have what are the specific problems they have and take those little ideas do your keyword research come back find hey maybe it's only 200 people a month who are searching for blogging mistakes or something like that and that's okay that's actually great because that's yes. 200 really high intent people who are like how do i avoid these problems i want to learn what problems to avoid so that's how i like to think about that stuff and then you just do 10 of those posts and then boom you've got your few thousand monthly readers I'm like amped up over here because I feel like this is something that we have to talk about too. So like, okay, so when you're doing keyword research and you see like, oh my God, this keyword only has like a hundred searches a month. It's totally not worth it. Well, A, think again, okay? Because here's the thing. One blog post, one page on your website, one product on your e-commerce shop can show up for numerous keywords, numerous keywords, different ways of saying things. I had a blog like or I, yeah, I had a blog on my website that was on page one of Google for seven years. I just dropped out of page one because like, I didn't want to update it. It's not my target audience anymore. I was on page one for seven years for over 12 keywords because it was the best solution to the problem. But I'm sure if I looked at the keyword research for one of those, it would have been like maybe only 50 searches a month. But when you're showing up for 12 of them, now we get to add up all of those monthly searches. And now you're going from 100 searches a month to actually 1,000 searches a month. So it's like we have to keep that in mind too. Yeah, this stuff really stacks up. And this, you know, this comes back to something I like to talk a lot about is that these things take time like blogging is not a get rich quick scheme it's not a way to grow your business if you have a service you sell or a product you sell already it's not a way to grow it rapidly overnight unless you already have an audience somewhere or you have partners who can promote it and sort of get you like amped up from the start but this stuff takes time you have to invest in really building a foundation and then going out and like not being afraid to shout from the rooftops about what you're doing and find the communities, find the places where your audience spends time. So what do you like to think about in terms of giving advice to people who are, you know, let's say on the beginner to intermediate scale, maybe they've been doing this for six months, a year or so. Um, how should they choose like the platforms to promote their content? Like where should they go? And how do you think about answering those? Yeah, I think it comes down to a few things. Like the first question most people are going to ask you is like, where is your audience hanging out? And like, okay, fair question. Totally fair. But like, I'm pretty sure I could find little pockets of my audience on basically every platform. So like, is that the most important platform to, or the most important question? To me, not really. To me, the most important question is, where do I want to show up? Because if I'm not excited to show up there, I'm not going to show up there. I'm going to keep procrastinating it. It's Or I'm going to show up in an energy of like resentment or already being defeated when it's like, well, that ain't the way to like create relationships or like grow a following or just like show up in a leadership role when you're already feeling resentful from the start. So I feel like, where do you want to show up? I would say from my experience, bloggers, Pinterest. Pinterest is a powerhouse, dude. It's a social media platform that drives the most amount of traffic to my website, like behind Google. And it's a platform that I spend the least amount of time on. So people think that Pinterest is like, it's only 
pictures of like interior design or like cool bed sheets. And like, I mean, it is, it, it has lots of cool bed sheets, but it's also like, a platform where people go to search things. It's also a search engine. And so Pinterest has been really great, especially for growing my email list, for getting people to purchase my digital products. And it's like I said, the platform that I spend the least amount of time on. And then I think the other thing that comes into this, so like if we're gonna move away from like getting on Google specifically, and like, let's say we're gonna not include YouTube in here, okay? like. We're not going to include video marketing. I would say the next question to ask is how can you collaborate with people in complementing niches and complementing industries? I have single-handedly grown my business from SEO and collaborations and relationships, hands down. And like these relationships that I've built eight years ago when I started my business are still paying off today. And so, and now like these people see me as like um, an expert in my field. And so now anytime that anybody builds a relationship with them, now I'm the SEO person. So I'm the SEO person in this pocket, this pocket, this pocket, this pocket, this pocket. And then all of a sudden I got people sliding into my inbox and they're just like, oh yeah, I got your recommendation from this person, from this person, signed up from your email list from this person. So it's like, can you collaborate? And I'm not saying like, if you're more introverted and you're like, right, that's why I started blogging. Like I am not extroverted. I'm not saying that you have to like do a YouTube live and like hop on video. What if you did a newsletter swap? What if you jumped into being a contributor for a summit? That's actually how me and you met. Both of us were on a live panel for a summit. Like you never know what kind of relationships you're going to be able to build. And I would suggest getting on a call with them just asking people, be curious about other people's zones of genius. Hey, what are you good at? Do you want to talk about it? And it, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be super awkward at first. But like when you hold the space to allow yourself to be curious about somebody else, they'll use usually reciprocate. And then you're like, how can I support you? That's why you only want to kind of collaborate and build relationships with people that you really jive with because you want to actually put the effort into supporting them and so you really have to like have an evil or an evil, oh God, not an evil, an even, an even playing field here and just like reach out to people and connect. So a long-winded way of saying, I like Pinterest and collaborations. Yeah, I love that. And you know, the I feel like the the subtext here of what you were talking about on collaborations is have fun with this. You know, like whenever I've, had people who reach out to me in a like super businessy way and want to have like a collaboration chat in a very like business context, like let's do this specific deal kind of thing. I and feel let's this outline the ROI oh. for the time of investment. And I'm like, I don't even know what ROI means. I gotta go. I just feel this aversion inside of like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, I just want to work with people I take, like. Take, take, take. Do you know what I mean? Like corporate style stuff, it feels like I'm showing up in this arena because I want something from you. Exactly. And it's like, if you show up in the sense of like, how can I support you? The natural law of reciprocity comes into play. Yeah. And do something for the other person first. It can be small. It can be sharing something from their blog on your social channels. It can be like just reaching out and saying, hey, you know, I love your work. Like just a droplet of kindness goes such a long way. Like I have had True. so many amazing relationships come from me just reaching out to someone sharing like, hey, I watched this video of yours and I absolutely loved it. Just wanted to say, you're awesome. And then I left it at that. And some people like they're busy. So I don't take it personally if I never hear back from them, but other people like really cool things like this will come from them. And I just think that's such a beautiful way to think about like collaborations is it's not transactional. The best ones should not be transactional in nature. Like there has to be this fundamental underlying like joy that you derive from your interactions with the other person. Otherwise, you're going to burn out on it. You're going to be like, why am I doing this with this other person? It feels like, you know, they want something from me or I want something from them and I'm not getting it. And there will just be this internal friction whether you're aware of it or not that ends up slowly torpedoing a relationship like that 
It's the same thing with social media, right? It's the same thing of like, if you don't want to be there, you will show up resenting it. It's the same thing with relationships. Like think about the cousin that you don't like. The cousin calls you and you're like, no, nah, crap. Like, I don't want to answer this text. And it's probably because the cousin has asked you for a million things and has never offered to like be there for you. You know what I mean? Or you just don't get along. Like we're humans. We're not going to get along with every single person. So yeah, I think exactly like you said just showing up and like being willing to support people and this is where authenticity comes in again how can you connect with somebody in a way that feels good if you're not connecting in a way that feels authentic that's when it gets hard too yeah it's hard for everyone it's hard for you it's hard for the other person it's yeah. hard for anyone else like watching or being involved so thank you for showing up authentically this is this is the kind of fun stuff that i just love doing um <laughs> so i wanted to ask you um another question this comes back to mistakes so i see lots of what i take as mistakes that people make who are relatively new in their blogging journey you work with a ton of small businesses not just mm -hmm. bloggers people who have like online stores things like that as well speakers um what kinds of mistakes do you see people making when it comes to, say, specifically SEO, people who want to get traffic from search engines? I would say the number one mistake, and I kind of already went off on this, is not understanding keyword research. Keywords are the things that connect your website to showing up in Google search. When you truly deep down do not understand keywords, and I'm not saying the basic level, surface level understanding of them. A lot of people think that they know keywords and then I have conversations with them and they don't like I have clients be like, well, I have my list of keywords. I was like, send it over. And it's one word keywords. And I was like, this ain't it. You know what I mean? So like truly like keywords, understanding keywords. And like, that's why I ended up hosting a live workshop about like how to find keywords that are actually effective. So if you guys wanted to go ahead and snag that replay, I do have it on my website. You can get $10 off with the code SEO love 10. But like in that workshop, that's why I created it because that's the biggest problem that I see. And so I broke down like the educational portion of it. And then the next half of it, I was like, yo, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna dive into a tool that I love using. I'm gonna walk you through exactly how I do it, like what I think about perspective shifts, what's coming up. And like, I really wanted to pull back the curtain because especially in my industry, also why am I holding a pen? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, especially in my industry, it's very like, don't look over here. This is SEO. Like it's so overwhelming. You're never going to get it. And I'm just like, what? No, I'll pull back the curtain. Like I'll show you. Also like with my clients, I'm not an SEO agency. It's just me when it comes to working on SEO stuff. I don't have a team of people. And so for me, I don't want my clients to need me forever. I want to empower and educate you because what happens with a lot of stuff with SEO agencies, you'll throw a ton of money at them. And then after that relationship a year later, you're like, okay, cool. Now what? Like, I have no idea how to keep this going. I have no idea what they did. And for me, since I don't have a team, I don't have the capacity to continue to offer ongoing support for people. So I'd rather educate them. And so I went off on a tangent, but like SEO is just one of those industries. Like I even had a website designer client. Okay. So she came to me and she was like, Mariah, we're looking to bring on like an SEO consultant. I've interviewed like seven people. Every single SEO person, when I was like, well, what's your strategy? And like, how do you kind of approach this? Like, what's the process? All of them said in one way or another, I can't tell you. <laughs> what? That's a problem. What do you mean? And I was like, listen, I understand where they're coming from because they don't want you to learn it and then not need them. Like, I understand people want to keep their jobs. They want to keep their clients. I understand that business model. It's just not mine. And I was like, and I also understand that what it takes to show up on page one for this keyword is completely different than what it takes to show up on page one for this keyword, because it's all context and keyword specific, because it's all dependent on the competition, what kind of content they have, all of that stuff. So I was like, so I understand why they said like, I don't want to tell you because it's also based on context, but like that's such an issue in this industry. And so I think that's why people have such an issue with keyword research because nobody's pulling back the curtain and showing them. Everybody's saying the same thing, long tail keywords. What does that mean? 
like say more, show me, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's not surprising when these people have these, are making these mistakes or like having these roadblocks because how are they supposed to learn if nobody's going to show them? Speaking of show me, let's show some people some live keyword research. So I've been, you know, doing this for a long time. You've been doing this for a really long time with other people too. And I just want to pop in. We're going to jump over to the screen share here. So yes, Mariah and I are still in the corner and I want to put a call out. So in the comments, please drop in some topics that y'all would like us to do some live keyword research on. Um, We've got a couple already, something e-commerce related maybe. Um, Voyage Toujours says best carry on backpacks to save on bag fees. I love that. That's super niche. Um, But let's hop over here. I've got my... This is my free tools page here, just ryrob.com slash tools. This stuff is 100% free. It always will be. But the keyword research tool, this is the one that I really use the most. And I wanted to just show y'all, let's use the example of the the travel backpacks. I think that is genius. Um, Carry on backpacks, right? Okay. So Mariah, using a term like carry on backpacks, what would you do? Would you even start by typing that in to a keyword research tool or would you take a different approach? I would start with carry on backpacks. I wanna see what's showing up for it. Because if I'm like, I'm starting with a topic and then I just allow myself to play and kind of get into a rabbit hole. So I would, yeah, carry on backpacks. What's showing up for that? I would also go to Google, type in carry on backpacks and see what's popping down in like related searches. Cool. Let's check out Google for this one. I love doing this too. Like this is, this is always a huge part of my own keyword research process is literally just seeing what is showing up. Seeing something like the best carry on travel backpacks is a clue. And also Interesting little note here, this may not be super consequential, but carry on has a dash in it. I typed in carry on one word. So that's like one little clue that I'd say how to frame this term for people. But yeah, I'm seeing, you know, listicles, right? XX best carry on backpacks and then year seems to be something a lot of these articles are weaving in. What are you taking away from this? We got the people also ask here as well. Um, So I'm actually a little bit behind. The only way that I can see your shared screen is if I watch it in a different tab. Oh, I got you. On the other thing. So I'm I'm a little behind here. But yeah, I'm basically seeing listicles. So here's the thing. If you're doing an e-commerce shop and you're like, okay, well, like, yo, I'm not trying to make a listicle of like my competitors. Do you know what I'm saying? You can do a list. If you have different carry on backpacks, you can do a listicle of your own backpacks, but like make sure that you emphasize what makes them different. Also with these keywords, like are we trying to optimize a collection page or a very specific product page? If we're trying to target a very specific product page, what makes this product different on your website? Is it a pink carry-on backpack? Is it a large carry-on backpack? Is it a camo carry-on backpack? Like what kind of backpack is this? Yeah, I love that. And that's how I would want to like frame this for people too, is like what I'm seeing here under the people also ask questions are some like really good SEO food right here. Like what size backpack will fit as a carry-on. And if you have an e-commerce shop where you sell carry-on backpacks, having content that answers questions like this, and I would, by the way, make that an individual blog post, like literally that, answer that question. That's amazing. I guarantee you so many people are searching for that and you being able to not only meet their need with an answer to this search query, but also be like, and here are 10 carry-on backpacks that you should consider. Yep. And Andy brings up a good point. He said, it's funny how all product recommendations end up being the same since everybody copies the first post. And that's the thing. So it's like, as a user, is that helpful? 
I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's going to be very dependent on the specific keyword. And then also keep in mind, so it's like maybe there's a trillion blog posts about like what size backpack will fit as a carry-on. And some people are going to be like, okay, well, like I don't want to write that because I'm not going to show up for it. We have to consider, especially now, Google cares a lot about topical authority. So if you have an e-commerce website and you're trying to show up for carry-on backpacks or like backpacks, you need to have content that tells Google that you are an authority on this topic. So write the blog post, what size backpack will fit as a carry-on. Use this for social media, put it on Pinterest. Maybe you wanna create a YouTube video about it, send it to your email list. You can use these kind of blog posts that are more topical authority building versus like SEO getting found on page one for like your content marketing plan for your business too. So like these blog posts can have different uses. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And thinking about it, like really just viewing your role as not someone who sells backpacks, but someone who provides solutions for people who need backpacks. And that's like, yep. that's the layer of like, you're going to create better video content. You're going to create better written content. You're going to just be thinking about this in a completely different way than how do I sell more backpacks as like, that is the lagging indicator of doing a good job of educating people and bringing solutions to people on this topic of backpacks. And I think that's the like, that's the real secret sauce here that'll lead you to do things like backpack reviews on YouTube because you enjoy doing it and you want to show people yes. here's how to get the most out of this pack and here's why you should get it, why you shouldn't get it. And so I like to think of this kind of stuff too as like, different use cases for different people. So think about, you know, if you sell carry on backpacks, like what are the different customer persona types that you have? You know, are you selling really exclusively to people who are like travel heavy users or are you selling to like, you know, maybe someone who's our parents age, who's like traveling very infrequently, but they're like, oh, wow, I think I want to carry my backpack on. How do I go about this to make sure it's the right size? These kinds of questions. So yeah, thinking about who your people are, I think is the foundation yeah. for this. Yeah. And Mark in the chat gave a good example too of like laptop backpacks. Like, do you have somebody that's like, you know what? I literally need a backpack because I'm carrying my laptop. And honestly, like, that's me. That's literally why I carry my laptop when, or my backpack when I travel is so that I can have my laptop on my back versus in another bag that's going to get mishmashed around. And then I can keep my water bottle and like all of that stuff for traveling. But I would say like, if you care a lot about your business, your brand, this stuff becomes a lot easier. Yeah. So on my project request form, when I'm working with clients, one of the questions is like, why do you want to invest in SEO? And sometimes people are like, because I want to make more money. Okay, listen, I'm not saying that that is a bad reason. Like, absolutely. There is a very high ROI when it comes to SEO. Like, cool. Here's the thing. I want you to care more uh, like about something more than just the money because the money isn't a deep enough desire to keep you motivated when the conversions aren't happening right away when you're first starting your business and you only had one sale in six months so it's like do you care are you passionate about it and i've seen that that's the difference between the businesses that kill it really well and the businesses that start to drown is because especially when you are a solo business owner, a small business owner, somebody starting off small, you don't have a massive team like HubSpot marketing to create like all of your content for you. So it's like you have to actually give a lot of shits in order to like keep moving through the organic marketing strategy. So I actually posted a reel on Instagram yesterday and I was like, do you want to know why SEO takes so, so long to see results? It's because it's testing and tweaking. Do you want to know what other things take a long time to see results? Literally every other form of organic marketing. Like, please tell me another form of organic marketing where you can set it up, start doing it, and you get sales instantly. You want to sell on Pinterest? It takes time. You want to sell on Instagram? It takes time. You want to sell on YouTube? It takes time. Organic marketing takes time. Even if you were to throw money at it and do ads, it can definitely lessen the amount of time that it takes ads still require testing and tweaking. So how are you going to stay enthused or excited within this organic marketing process? It's probably 
the fact that you're passionate about what you're selling or what you're doing. So it's like, we have to have a deeper desire there. And some people don't, and that's fine. But like, those aren't usually the people that I end up working with. Yeah. And I would argue if you can be honest with yourself and, and say, oh, I don't have a deep desire about this topic area that I'm trying to grow a business around, maybe you should consider doing something else. This life is a limited experience, man. Like, don't beat yourself up trying to grow something that you feel just an aversion to inside when you have to sit down and do it. And, you know, and Andy in the in the comments here, like left a really good example of this, like so many people who do backpack reviews or videos of backpack reviews, like it'll be stock images and people will just have this, whether they're aware of it or not, they'll feel it, that it's not as authentic, not as real as someone who goes out and buys five backpacks and does the review and like talks through them with you, showing you them in real life. And the connection that you'll build with someone is going to be completely different than someone who's just hypothetically talking about these backpacks or, or saying they've used them. And, yep. you know, a little hack, I don't necessarily re advise doing this, but one could consider buying backpacks and returning them after you make a video if you don't want to have 50 backpacks in your closet one day. Um, not recommending, but that's something someone could do. Um, and I wanted to, so, you know, I wanted to jump on, Mike left another good question about keyword research here. Could you speak to a business service offering something like management consulting that's super crowded, highly competitive and difficult to differentiate? So Mariah, I'm going to kick this one over to you, but I'm going to pull up our screen again and start to do a little keyword research we can show people. Yeah. So the first question is like, what kind of management consulting? Best question. That's the first question because like management consulting, what does that mean? How do you become the best solution to the problem when I don't understand what the word is? So it's like, is it corporate management consulting? Is it small business management consulting? Is it IT management consulting? Like what kind of management consulting? And I think that automatically is going to really narrow down the results for you. And the people that are searching for that are also going to be more likely to convert, more likely to reach out because they're further along in the buyer process because they know what kind of consulting that they're looking for. So you're probably not gonna get something that's like a thousand searches a month if you're doing like IT management consulting. And I mean, like, honestly, you might, you know what I mean? Like, I have no idea, but getting more specific is going to be the very first thing that we do. So Mike said strategic growth management consulting. And my initial reaction to that is that is still a pretty amorphous term. Like when I hear strategic growth management consulting, I'm not 100% sure what that means to me. Yeah, How do you feel who? about that? Yeah, I want to know like for who. Right. For, for who? who? Like, like strategic growth, like for what? Right. And I've got this up just in Google to, to show everyone here. And, you know, what's interesting here is I love typing in a keyword phrase into a Google search bar and then just allowing like the suggestions to filter in here. Because what I see is that, you know, strategic growth strategy consulting framework, growth strategy consultants, right? So if you're wanting to be brand yourself as a growth strategy consultant, maybe that's a keyword phrase to go after. But again, like for who i think that's where you will really get the right kind of people coming to your site um, which is always better than just having a thousands of people who come and then they leave because they're like oh this isn't really for me so that's our question to you mike is for what people and we've got for small and middle market companies so you've you've given a, a revenue figure here what kind of companies and it doesn't have to mean you only work with one type of company, but are we talking about, you know, insurance agents? Are we talking about flooring companies? Like getting really yeah. specific, I think, is where you really like, that's where you'll find gold with SEO, not necessarily from a traffic perspective, but generating leads and revenue from SEO. I'm just responding to somebody in the comments here, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then also consider, are they typing in corporate? Right. Are they typing in executive? Like I know that those are like more corporate -y terms that maybe somebody would type in corporate, executive, something like that. Like, I don't think that anybody's going to type in middle market right. companies or like middle market strategic growth. Like it sounds 
very like crap i'm forgetting the word like it just it sounds um very like lingo-y you know what i mean yeah yeah and so it's like, like that's... and i don't know if google's gonna understand that enough to be able to bring in results too exactly like you have to really put yourself in the shoes of someone who is doing this search and i can almost guarantee you that nobody is searching strategic growth management consulting for small and middle market companies like that isn't that isn't what a real human will be searching for when they're searching for your help and i love like the idea of growth management consultant i think that's like that's the top level seed of something that you can really work with there and i just pulled that up i think that's going to be too broad to be really useful for you mike in your business but you know you left a comment here if you have expertise in multiple industries how would i do that and my advice and then i'll let mariah chime in my advice is have separate landing pages or separate blog posts that target the separate services pages exactly for sure. yeah. target those three five different people types of people types of companies that you like to work with and, then and that way the content on that page speaks exactly to that person. So it's like if you offer growth management consulting to an IT person, the I could do this for your business or like the the outcomes that you provide could look completely different compared to like an agricultural business. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like those outcomes could look very different. Same thing in the medical field. So I would just consider and like speak their language. So don't be afraid to create different services pages. So a lot of people services pages are like, oh, I do, let's say website design. I do website copywriting. Like they're completely different services. And people think that that's the only way that you can create services pages, but you can create different services pages that speak to different industries. And that's how we can target those specific keywords. Yeah. But I have one page that's called services. So no because google is not going to see like an overarching page like that as the best solution to the problem for it growth consulting services because there's other pages that are literally created specifically for the it industry so it gets really like convoluted when we start adding everything to a services page and then you end up not being the best solution to any problem because you're the solution to all of them. So in terms of user experience, I think like having a blurb about your services on one page is fine. And then including a button that takes them to the very specific industry service page is another way to think about it. Yeah, I love that. I think that's perfect, nothing to add. Um, I just pulled up this example though and wanted to show you, Mike, the how I would be thinking about it if I'm a dentist, let's say, and I'm like, how do I grow my dentist practice, dental practice? Maybe I would Google search that, how to grow my dental practice. But maybe if I am already specifically kind of that middle funnel, bottom funnel, looking for a consultant to help with growth, I'll probably type in something like growth consultant for dentists. And yeah. you'll see like, there aren't a ton of people going after this, but there are some like Kent Sears, dental marketing and practice growth consultants. Like, that is a smart SEO play right there. Like there may not be thousands upon thousands of people searching this term every month, but I guarantee you that someone who is really wanting to hire a growth consultant for their dental practice is going to find that page and they're going to be like, oh, I need to talk to Kent. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So replicating that as much as you can, I say, is the move. Um, but we've got time for just two more minutes here. Mariah, is there anything you want to add? Anything you feel like we missed that people should get from this? Any takeaways you want to leave our audience with? Uh, yeah, give yourself some grace. Like SEO is like multi-layered. It's multi, it's like very, it can be really complex. Also keep in mind that a lot of like the SEO, how to help like tutorials coming up from like Moz.com and from HubSpot Marketing, Neil Patel, all of those, those are really great starting points to really get your toes wet in here. But remember that a lot of the times their SEO viewpoints are created for middle to high level companies with numerous people on their teams. So just remember that like all of their suggestions, their technical SEO, all of that stuff, just remember that it might not pertain to your business or it might not be a priority yet. Do you know what I mean? So that's why 
like I say that what it takes to get on page one is very different keyword to keyword because it depends on your competition. And so don't overwhelm yourself thinking that you have to get everything perfect because you don't. You don't. You have to get enough things perfect to outrank the competitors for that keyword. So like give yourself some grace. It's baby steps. If you don't already have Google Search Console set up in your website, absolutely do that. I have a tutorial that walks you through the entire process on my website. Set up Google Search Console, set up a sitemap because we have to be able to test and tweak. We have to be able to see our data. Okay. So it's like baby steps and collecting data. That's how we're able to continue to grow. That's all organic marketing is in a nutshell. It's testing and tweaking. We're all experimenting. I don't know what keyword you're going to show up on page one for. I can optimize it. I can do the research. But like at the end of the day, we have to let Google know what the topic is about. And then we have to test and tweak it. And so I think just that can be really overwhelming for people. I think that's why I'm obsessed with SEO. Yeah. It's because there's always something to learn. But as somebody that's doing this themselves, when you're blogging, when you have an e-commerce shop, when you're selling services, that's why I think pairing SEO with collaborations is so damn powerful. Because SEO, the thing that can really take a little bit of time in order to build up some things, organic marketing stuff, where relationships and collaborations add fuel to its own fire can have like a shorter time frame for returns because when you collaborate with somebody, they're then like uh, basically speaking for you. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, definitely like buy these backpacks because I trust this person. Now the viewers are like, oh, I already trust this person because the person that I trust trusts this person. So why wouldn't I trust this person? So that's why I think being able to combine searchable strategies with collaborations is so powerful. And then when you have your SEO foundations on your website set up, all of these collaborations and everything is just adding fuel to the fire. Hopefully you're getting backlinks and stuff like that. So keep all of this stuff in mind. It's baby steps, but I would say focus on the foundation, track your data, do the keyword research, and then start collaborating. This is beautiful. And like, this is the fruition of doing all those things right here, what you and I are doing. So it's, it really fills my heart and everyone, please check out Mariah's content. She has a ton of awesome stuff on her website, mariahmagazine.com, and her YouTube channel is where it's really popping off. You've inspired me yeah, to real. take YouTube serious this year, so thank you. Pretty good. It's the only searchable marketing channel that pays me to create content, yeah. and it's searchable. So it's like people are literally searching for my content two years, three years later, and I'm still making money from ads. And I'm getting, people are finding me, even though it's tutorial based. So like a lot of people are like, educational content doesn't sell. For me, it does. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is, it just does. So I think it's because people see that I'm an expert and then they're like, she's an expert, I'm gonna buy a digital product. I'm going to reach out to her for consulting. So it's like, keep in mind that like, you also get to create any videos that feel good for you in order to create them. You know what I mean? So it's like, yo, if you are down with the get down on YouTube, like I said, it's the only platform that pays me to then market my own business. I think it's such a powerhouse. Yeah, it's genius. All right, I love it. Thank you all for the amazing questions. 113 comments, what? Amazing. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. Thank you all, Mariah, thank you again. And yeah, next week I'm going live on Mariah's channel. So. If you're not already subscribed to her channel on YouTube, definitely do that. We'll link to it in the description um, below this video as well. So you can join us again for round two on whatever Mariah wants to talk about next week. Oh yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for commenting. Thank you for watching. Definitely reach out to me and Ryan. I think both of us kind of use people's comments and questions in order to really inspire content. So like, don't be afraid to reach out, slide into some DMs, email us, whatever you want. Thank you for asking such great questions. Thank you for coming and allowing both me and Ryan to kind of get, get into the rabbit hole that we love getting into. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. All right, thank you all and we'll see you next week. All right, sounds good, bye. Bye.